Hey everybody, it's William Spencer, uh, the Skate Ninja, also that, um, and welcome to the sh- podcast. Uh, right on. What's up guys? Welcome to the Shit Podcast, a perfect place to have good skateboarding conversations. Today we have a very special guest for this, a very authentic and creative skateboarder. He is the ninja of skateboarding. He is William Spencer. What's up William? How is it going? Dude, it's good. How are you, man? Very good. Very nice. Thank you for that. So what are you doing right now? Are you going to skate? Yeah, actually, I was hunting down uh, a new spot right now. And of course, typical skateboarder brain, I got all hyper focused. And then I realized I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm supposed to do just to talk to these guys right now. So I just kind of pulled over on my way, you know. So how, how much time have you been doing your ninja stuff uh, since you started? For- yeah, f- forever. I've been, forever? I mean... Yeah, since the beginning, because I um, I think I was just an adventurous little kid, you know, that I was more like when I you watch movies and all the crazy stuff that you like, you know how sometimes people put stuff in boxes. So they're like, oh, this is like a cool movie that I like, but then this is what I like to do. And then this is um, what I'm good at. I kind of just like to mix all the things together. So right. I never really had boundaries between all the things that I like so I just kind of put it all in the skateboarding that's yeah. nice so your your main passion was the skateboarding uh, when I was a kid I used to climb trees a lot just oh, always okay. climb trees like a monkey okay. you know um, and then when I was a little bit older maybe like nine or ten my older brother made me skateboard you know and then around the same time that I learned to skateboard through him I started to do karate and so for the next four years um i worked my way to getting a black belt in karate and then skateboarded too like in between there you know so but funny i've never you know people always accuse me of that and it's actually unfortunately took a lot of creativity out of my skateboarding that was like an original thought but i've never um i never practiced parkour or anything. Never. Okay. No. You just climbed tricks? Yeah, right. I just climbed and jumped and then I saw, you know, like Jackie Chan movies. Yeah. Because Jackie Chan doesn't do parkour. Jackie Chan just moves. He just moves through the space that I sort of just t- took that idea and was like, oh, I want to just move through the space. <laughs> but with my skateboard, I never, it wasn't until later that I made my first few video parts, like Colorado yeah. and In Color and Burning Daylight, that I met people that did parkour that knew me that thought I did it. And I was like, no, I've never. And so then they taught me some things. But before that time, I had never, I didn't even know what it was. I didn't have a computer. (laughs) That's great, man. So are you a stuntman? Are you a skater? Are you a ninja? Are you a Spider-Man? What are you, man? (laughs) Well, that's hard. I don't, I mean, I think what's cool is, uh, you know, within skateboarding, the names that you remember the most are usually the most interesting, like Ragdoll, Lizard yes. King, you know, Trainwreck, like all these names that I I think it's weird if you ever call yourself that, you know, but Michael Burnett, when he did that first article in Thrasher for me, he's the one who called me the Skate Ninja. Oh. And so it just sort of stuck. So I think it's kind of an honor that A, that he named me that, that I didn't name myself that. And then B, I think it's kind of a, it's, it's cool that people, it's like an alter ego so that I can be a stuntman or I could be Spider-Man. And that's sort of my like skateboarding alter ego. So I think it's, I think it's nice. Like, I don't think I would have named myself that, but I think it's okay. cool. Yeah. Okay. Ninja skating. That's yeah. nice. And how did you get the skills? You were mentioning that climbing trees, but 
uh, what was like your academy where we where you get all these crazy skills um so this is what happened is when i was like like i said i started skating when i was like nine or ten yeah. my older brother uh without anyone teaching him he could do back handsprings down the driveway and he could do flips like he would stand on top of like uh, a dumpster you stand on top of like a tree trunk and he would just do backflips off it so i saw that and we had a trampoline as a kid so i was too scared to do that and i wasn't very good yet so i would just practice all my things that i could do on the trampoline and then i just slowly over time okay. learned how to flip off the trampoline like from trampoline off the trampoline and then over things and i just slowly like developed my own style by just trying out things um that i could do on the trampoline off and then i just took all my climbing and i just kind of just taught myself to yeah do what jackie chan does i just said oh i'm gonna do my version you know and so i just kind of taught myself and obviously with karate like karate they teach you strikes and kicks and cool stuff and body awareness but no i never went somewhere to learn it really you know okay was was like an organic and natural process yeah 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 it was really organic yeah okay yeah. that's pretty nice i like that you're very unique so what was the most difficult moment of your career maybe an injury or or no difficult moments oh no they're all difficult all <laughs> it's it's sure. choosing between it's choosing between which one is the hardest oh, okay, you know? okay, okay. there's so there's so many i've struggled so much to be yeah. That's true. where I am. So, so many years. I've seen so many people that were younger than me or started skateboarding after me and then got really good and became pro and have their name on a skateboard. And the whole time I've been working away in a different way and I don't have my name on a skateboard. I'm not, I'm not pro for anyone that just the struggle to kind of like create your own version of skateboarding is is really hard so i mean i guess now is the hardest time because yes. i'm i'm doing a new video part um that i'm on my last trick right now and it's taken me about four years to oh. work on between movies and doing stunts and just living life but um i've never pushed myself this hard to make anything because in my mind i think i thought that people when they think about my skateboarding, it seems really fun and it seems entertaining and it seems like crazy, but I don't think people think about it in a way that it's good. Like, oh my gosh, you're amazing. You should be professional or you're so good at this that people should pay you. I just, I never made my skateboarding in the way that you uh, viewed me that way. So what I did was in this video part is I wanted to make things that were entertaining that like made you laugh or like you felt like oh my gosh i didn't think you were gonna do that like surprise you but i also wanted to make it good enough that if you connect to the type of skateboarding that i'm making that you you say to yourself yeah he i could see someone paying him to do that and not for anyone else because i i think the evolution of skateboarding and where it goes is not up to any of us like rodney mullen invented so many things and then his career just died and then it was just good good luck that he was brought back in secondhand smoke and was able to evolve into street skateboarding that for me and by the way and i say this in a lot of interviews i'm not comparing myself at all because he's a master i'm not at all on that level or anywhere near that but the concept of reinventing yourself at a level that i feel good because most video parts that i made i felt good about certain things in them but i was never like self-confident enough i never liked myself enough to wow. to say yeah that, i did that that was me i like it like i was worried that people didn't like it and then i wasn't sure because i get compelled to make things i just get i like just need to make it and i'm sorry if it's bad but i have to and i understand if not everyone connects to that so this is the first time that i put in this much work and struggled this hard and am not apologizing for what oh. it is like yeah where if you yeah. don't like it i don't care if you don't like it i work so hard that i'm impressed with me because yeah. i like i tried to kill myself and i didn't die and that's awesome so take it well, or leave sure. it but but yeah i've worked 
I've worked so hard on tricks in this part that I've gone back like 15 different days, like just so, so much you are working on this part. This part is not yet in the web, or we no, it isn't. And, and and but I am on my very last trick. Oh, and and it is the ender of the or do you have the ender? Uh, dep depending on how it fits, you know. All depending right. On how it fits. But, but uh, the trick's in your mind right now. Uh, oh no, I've been try I've been trying it. I've failed at it maybe. I bet you I practiced it for one year. I wow. just practice it for a year, and then uh, and then I've tried maybe six, seven times. I've gone seven days to try it. Okay, and with each time the the process is better. You are you are about to land the trick or skateboarding. Maybe Sometimes I, it all depends. Sometimes I fall yeah. really hard. Sometimes I get nowhere close. Yeah, yeah that's true. So, uh, where, when do you think this video part is going to be in the web? Maybe the next I, week? I think um, it will be probably February or March. February, okay. But you think this is like the most amazing that you have done? Mm, I think it's... Being objectives. I think it's the hardest I've ever worked. All right. That's how I gauge things more because you know sometimes you put all your heart and all your hard work into something and for whatever reason it gets online and people are like, oh, yeah, let's go. you know, I don't know why, but they just don't connect. Yeah. So I don't connect like that. I don't go, this is the best thing I've ever made in the heart, in the coolest. I just go, this is the hardest I've ever worked because that's the thing that's the truest. Like that is for sure, you know, so. That's nice. So do you think it is better to have low expectations for that, uh, for uh, for not to get disappointed when people react to the to the to the result. I I think in a certain way, but really, what I'm doing is I'm disconnecting the two things. Oh right. How hard I worked, how hard like it was, what I feel about it, and then what other people think. Because this can can't be controlled. This is crazy, right? This can slap you in the face. People don't care. People don't care what you did, right? But yeah. my own hard work and how I push myself to do the things that I was terrified of, no one can mess with that. You can't mess with that. That's me. So that's why I go with this side and that side. Good, you know, like good luck. I've spent so much time on things and no one cares. And I've spent no time on something and everyone loves it. Yeah. So I just can't, I can't connect to it anymore. I'm just kind of. That's you know. true. And this is an independent project. You are working for yourself, or maybe you are working for a brand. Talking about no, yeah. no, I don't. You know what's crazy? I am one of those people that's like, as a person or as a figure, I'm very mysterious to people. You know, and they're like, oh, where is he? What does he do? So people don't connect to me. Like people don't hit me up to. You know what I mean? Like normally yeah. I'm like kind of by myself doing something, and I would love a, a sponsor or whatever, but. So far, I think I make things that are kind of like so far off the like uh, normal that people find it hard to kind of like want to get involved yet until they see it successful and then people jump on board a little bit. But for me, I make enough money like as a stuntman and like an actor and like filmmaker that yeah, it would be cool to have a sponsor, but also it's kind of nice every once in a while to have your own deadlines and not be feeling the pressure because somebody else needs to make money and get something done. So that part I do appreciate where I can kind of sponsor myself and not worry people that, you know, are worried about me being productive or whatever. So Yeah, that's true. I agree with you. Uh, so you were in the Spider-Man movie, is that right? Yeah, I was actually in two of them. Okay, yeah. and how was that experience? What did you, you know what? The, the first film, uh, was kind of mind blowing because uh, I missed the audition. One oh. of my good friends who was gonna also be a stunt double for Spider-Man, I missed the audition. I was back in Colorado filming skateboarding and I felt awful. And then what ended up happening is that they had picked the stuntmen, the other stuntmen that were gonna double Spider-Man and they were practicing for months and months and months. And then what's crazy is they hired the stuntmen first and then they hired Andrew Garfield, right? But when oh, Andrew right. Garfield got there, 
he started studying up and he was like, hey, I think this character should skateboard. He started scouring the internet for people that he thought, oh, this guy could be Spider-Man on skateboard. He found my videos and at lunchtime when he was with the stunt team practicing to be Spider-Man, he, he said, hey, what about this guy? And my friend Ilron Choi laughed and he said, that dude is an idiot. I tried to get him to the audition and he didn't come. And Andrew was like, oh, well, okay, well, let's get him in here. And so then I got a new opportunity to get on the movie that way. Yeah, it was really cool. And what's crazy, and it's little known, and in a certain way, it's so flattering that it's kind of weird to even talk about yourself, but Andrew actually based his Peter Parker on, on me because yeah. he just as a person he was like yeah man you know you just kind of make sense for this character you're like a little bit emo and mad about stuff but you skateboard and you're even down to i used to cut my pants and stitch them up the the legs but i would hand stitch it in a certain okay. way and down to even how i dressed he made the character dress like me so it's deeply flattering from from him to me but on the outside nobody else realizes or knows which is totally fine because Usually yeah. as a stuntman or whatever, you don't get credit for stuff anyway. So it's right on par with the usual. But to me, it was really cool for him to say, I think you're cool enough to base this on. So that was awesome, you know. That was nice. Um, yeah. And making a comparison between filming for a movie such as this, a Spider-Man movie, and filming for a video part, what do you think between, between these both experiences? You know what? I think the the thing that anyone who has filmed like a big video part or film skateboarding at all, or you know, been part of that process, the craziest thing is is I'll tell you this, right? In the Spider-Man movie, you know, they they brought me on because they saw my video parts and what I was capable of, and said, "All right, you know, you should be Peter Parker and skateboarding, whatever." But during the movie. They didn't let me film any of the things that I'm like known for or good at or have a, you know, some sort of a, a handle on because filmmaking process is so fast. fast. And so much money is just bleeding. If you, if you spend too long that I was like, I'm not saying I'm not proud of those movies because I am. There's so many things in there that I'm proud of, but the skateboard experience on there, I didn't get to do much. Like it just, It's no one's fault. It's just the way that it goes. But the comparison is, is skateboarding, you have a, a huge chunk of time to do something so incredible. And then filmmaking, they expect you to do that. But unless you're like Rodney Mullen or Tony Hawk, that's like every day you're on a vert ramp doing McTwist, you can McTwist every try. They're not impressed and they don't let you reach your peak of where you can be, what you can really do on a skateboard. They don't have time to let you do a hundred tries. And so it's a little bit heartbreaking. You know, people will say, oh, I heard of you, come be on my commercial. And then when they're like, all right, do something crazy. And you're all, how much time do we have? You know, yeah. because that that's the hardest part is they don't realize that American mentality of filmmaking is like, the only thing that really matters is the acting. Everything else is extra. When some movies, if they're action movie or movies about skateboarding, people feel cheated when you don't have something that's truly real in there, you know? Like, they don't they don't fake the X Games. The X Games, right? You see people flying over doing triple backflips. It's really happening. It would be crazy if they were like, well, you know what? You know, this event needs to end 30 minutes early, so let's just fake him doing a few backflips. Yeah, we'll just we'll fill it in later. It's like a crazy concept, <laughs> but in a movie, people do that to you all the time. They're like, you don't even have to land it. You're like, then why am I here, you know? Yes. And so it, it's hard because sometimes you're playing a mascot of yourself. You don't get to actually do any of the cool stuff that you want. You're just kind of like a representation of, you could do it, but you're not going to get to, you know, is what it's what sometimes it boils down to, so. Okay, but it was a nice experience. Um, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, amazing experience. It's incredible. I went to New York. I, I got to film with Andy Armstrong and his son, James, the stunt coordinator and the second unit director. And they're incredible. They're, they're such smart dudes. They're so clever. They, they are like, they're such household names within stunts. And to be 
with them and like be brought into their team and them actually accept that and want me to be there is incredible because they're they're legendary for what they do in the stunt world you know That's so nice. yeah so that experience was incredible the people i met andrew is super cool very passionate like just like you know when you get so mad skateboarding that you're just like you're like shaking fences and you're breaking stuff because you want he's like that about acting you know and it's it was really cool to, to have someone be that passionate that i could just argue with like like a brother we would just argue about stuff i'm like that's stupid let's not do it like that he's like yeah let's do it. and it felt good to care that much about making spider-man look good that meant a lot to me All right. that he was that into it you know with me. i guess yeah he, and i'm sure he feels the same way he's bright you know he he gave me a rap gift and he was like gave me this comic book some spider-man comic book and he wrote on the cover he's like <laughs> A wonderful start to a long and painful friendship, <laughs> and that's really what it is, you know, because we're we care so much about making Spider-Man be who he was when you were a kid and you yes. saw the comic books. You wanted to be that good, so anything that you can do to make that happen, you'll do it. And so he and I are both desperate for that, which is is cool to share that with him. And then second, he actually skates, dude. He totally skates. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, we cruise around New York. Dude, he can do like fakey big spins. He can ollie up curves. He can manual. He can, he probably can do a ton of stuff, but he was rusty, obviously, from, I don't know, just, you know, working and whatever else he's doing. But he can totally shred, man. It was cool. That's cool. A nice experience. And was yes. your first movie this? For uh, Spider Man was your first movie? Oh, no. You know what's crazy is, you know how people always talk about the like overnight success? <laughs> I was probably in LA six years before that ever okay. happened. Yeah, and I did background work for two years where they pay you nothing and you just like walking around behind famous people trying not to look stupid. Nice. Um, yeah, and I've done like tons of commercials and tons of. I think my very first movie was uh, either The Kids Are All Right or maybe it was Project X. Or Project S, and, and what did you do in that in that movie? Project X, I dropped in on a two-story house. With so your I skateboard? Second... With your skateboard? Okay. Yeah. I will oh, watch dude. it. I I, don't, I didn't remember that. <laughs> yeah, if you okay. watch, there's a guy. He tr I drop in. I don't know why I thought it was a good idea, but <laughs> I drop in on the second story and then drop down the first story, and I'm supposed to drop onto the deck, and it was so slick on the roof that my board shot out as I came off the first drop. And then, you know, when you're coming down, all your weight's coming down? Oh yeah. But I did it all the way off the two-story deck onto my butt. And I thought I broke my arm because I fell Ooh. so hard. And they made me, so that my skateboard wouldn't shoot out, they made me tie my skateboard to my ankle. What? So sketchy. <laughs> yeah, scary. they're like, you might hit the crowd. I was like, you're, I'm, dude, if this thing gets wrapped up in my wheels, I'm dust. Anyway, <laughs> um, but yeah, I've done, Before Spider-Man, I did TK Luther, which is like a Disney TV show. I did some stunt doubling on on that, for like both the lead characters with Jimmy Garecki and like Billy Roper and like Mike York. Okay. Um, oh my gosh, so What many else? people. Sammy Sammy Baptista was on there. Okay. Uh, man, I, I I can't think of everyone right now. Big Cat was on there. Who else? Just a fun. Anyway, super fun to, for a couple of years. Um, I worked on that in Manhattan Beach, but yeah, just tons of commercials and yeah, in a few movies. I mean, I've done quite a bit, but I also is one of those, one of those people where I don't, a lot of people are like really proud of that and I am proud, but I just like am forgetful about that stuff where I really have to look back at my own resume and be like, oh yeah, I did do that. <laughs> oh yeah. Because I just like, I'm always thinking about the next thing. But yeah, that's nice. Uh, a whole career in filmmaking. So what did you enjoy the most? To do skateboarding or the filmmaking? Because I, I think our uh, two passions that you have. Yeah, I think, I think the filmmaking because okay. I, when I started to get into this world, I always thought that just like, I didn't think you divide it up into stuntman, producer, writer, director actor because when you make stuff as a kid you're like you just make it right yeah. and so for me the roles. yeah 
Yeah, and that's why I started acting and, and writing short films of being myself because what you realize the more you're out here is like in skateboarding, it's the easiest thing because you're like, I have an idea, I'm gonna get a filmer, and now I'm gonna go film it. And there's no middleman, there's no one to mess with you, there's no one to tell you that you're out of time, there's no one to tell you, oh, that's stupid. You just, you just like it, and then you film it, that's it. And so, my sort of like getting into acting and doing like the two Bellman short films and stuff, where I'm like the lead actor, but also, you know, do the Jackie Chan where I do my own stunts. Um, I did that with my business partner, Malachi, because I was sick of people not letting me do what I want to do, you know? Yes. Because out here, everybody has their own vision and you get hired as a stuntman or whatever, and you do what people tell you because that's their vision. But if you're a real artist, a person who really likes filmmaking, you end up having to make stuff yourself because it, everybody takes a turn. I'm not mad at whoever that I just come and do stunts for you or I come and act for you or whatever. I'm not mad at that. We all take our turn, but unless you make your own projects, you don't really get a turn because no one believes in you like that and can write stuff for you and can write action or can write comedy for you. That's as funny as you can do because they're just not you, you know? So that's why I started doing my own stuff. And I think that filmmaking is what I enjoy the most because I like entertain more than I want people to think I'm good at stuff or want people to, to think that I'm awesome or whatever. I want to entertain people. I just like surprising people and filmmaking helps me do that more than pretty much anything else, you know? So. Okay. So it's your main passion, filmmaking. Yeah. I like that. I love filmmaking. Do you love movies also? Yeah. So. What's well, not to love? Yeah. What's not to love? That's nice. So what what did you do to stay in shape? You know, to, to be in the condition always to do your stunts. What what is a daily a daily routine for you? Do you work out? So funny, I don't work out at all. Oh. But the one you know what's funny, the one thing that I do normally is I like when I was a kid, I used to shovel a lot or rake or haul rocks right because my dad would make me do all those things so that i think that built my body up just in a natural way you know how people go to like crossfit and they like pick yeah. up the big tire or they end up like using something that looks yes. like a sledgehammer i did all that stuff for real like just because my dad's like yeah we need to make a wall and so you just haul <laughs> the bricks over right so okay. my body's built up from that and then to stay in shape all i do is really struggle at doing flips or skateboarding or like any physical challenge that I think of it takes me a long time to usually do stuff whether it's because I'm afraid or it's like really hard and I just do it so much almost obsessively that it just keeps me in shape because I can't exercise like if you took me to like CrossFit and made me hit something I'd be like well this is just like a sledgehammer we should just break something down or build something like what are we doing so That's how I keep it shaped. The only thing that I've been doing that's a, that's working out right now is for this trick, I'm having to flip and land on my skateboard from a pretty big height. It's a, it's a roof drop for my last trick. And I've been doing squats every day to be able to take the impact. Okay. So if I do work out though, uh, I only do it like a very specific reason. I do squats for this exact trick and I actually stand on my skateboard and do the squats in the exact position that I land in, you know? Okay. Just, but that's like a very specified thing. But in general, I usually just skateboard or do, like I said, flips or some weird physical challenge. And I do it so much for a couple of hours that I just stay in shape. So as long as you're like, if you're bad at skateboarding or it's really hard for you, it's perfect because then your body's like, all right, you know? For sure, I get you. Yeah. And what about your self-confidence? When do you feel more confidence on your skills? Yeah, so basically, I, over the last 10 years, I have, you know, it's very funny about self-confidence or like, for instance, how you view yourself in general, right? It's, I think all of us, we don't mean to, but we have a very skewed perspective on ourselves, right? Because I feel like most of us are stuck in sort of like a little kid mentality and all the things that bother us about ourselves and all the things that we don't like are all the things that we we like fixate on. We're like, oh my gosh, this person has this. Like, wouldn't it be nice? You know, like everything, <laughs> teeth, face, how you 
like how you look, how tall you are, whatever that is normally. For me, I just started to realize, like, I usually don't take people's outside opinion. And one of the only things that I take it for usually is like self-confidence reasons. It's how people react to you because in your head, you're like, oh, I'm such an idiot or these tricks are so weird and stupid. And if I was somebody else, I wouldn't like this that I started going, well, for once, why don't you just see how people react to how you make them feel? Like, okay. does, does it make people feel good? Does it make people feel bad? Does it make? And when I started realizing that a person who is just kind of like real, like, I'm just like, yeah, this is who I am. Like, sorry, I don't know what you want from me, but this is that you start to realize people like that. They like the truth. They like that. You're like, yeah, it's ugly. I'm like, I'm an idiot sometimes. You're like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. So I started to getting self-confidence when I, A, stopped caring what anyone thought, and then B, over the last 10 years, I've pushed myself in ways that have terrified me. Like, just uh, like things that I'm truly, really, really, really afraid of. And I just realized like, you don't get, you don't get to be on a movie and you don't get to, to be somebody unless you're doing stuff that other people don't want to do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Other, the, the only way you get ahead, the only way you make a name for yourself is doing stuff. If it seems easy or it seems fun, there's probably someone else doing it right now and doing it better than you. They just are, right? Everyone's yes. amazing. Instagram is a talent show every day of the week. Every right? day. Every day of the week. I'm very so young me, people doing it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. But I just learned from myself for the last 10 years that I pushed myself so hard and faced so many things that I was afraid of that I just earned my own self-respect. Like I literally earned it and was like, wow, dude, you like you're terrified and you still did that. You're terrified and you still tried it. That's awesome. And I finally able to step outside myself with enough time and then looking back at what you accomplished, even though in the moment you felt like it wasn't going to work or that you were like, oh my gosh, everyone's going to realize I'm a complete idiot or like I shouldn't be here or this is a fluke or you guys made a mistake picking me. When you look back, you see the quality of the work, not usually in the moment, right in the moment. I'm always like, oh my God, like this is the worst thing that I've ever made. And then later... <laughs> through either an outside appreciation or more time your perspective shifts until you're like I don't hate that that's actually pretty cool and I've thankfully gone like have had the ability to not get injured and can carry on long enough to look back and appreciate myself a little bit and it has taken a long time so anybody who's listening and is like ooh I still hate myself you're like just keep <laughs> going at some point you will you'll stop because you'll realize it's amazing that any of us are still alive and that we get to do anything we want to do because this planet and what's happening dude it all feels like it's going downhill so you better just enjoy your good years right now just freaking enjoy it stop worrying and just start enjoying the fact that your legs are working and be done with it you know? that's nice so what what is your advice to um to not be afraid about that about what people can say about the results that we produce What is your advice to just say like, hey, just relax, man, and, and do, do your stuff for you? You know what I mean? You know what? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. This is what I was going to say is, um, I feel like I've used this example before and it's, it's always made a lot of sense to me. And I think sometimes each example hits a certain person in a certain way. But to me, you remember when you were a little kid, right? And you had like, for me, I had action figures. I had like, little Spider-Man and Captain America and I had all the toys in my room right or GI Joe's and you play with them right and you're like having the best time ever and never maybe kids now because they can't help it it's like their brains have been infiltrated but I never once when I was playing and having fun looked around and went am I doing this right yeah. am I playing correctly is this <laughs> good can anyone tell me is this good playing that I'm doing now no you do it for you you do it because you feel like it and you like it if it's anything besides that sure it's good to like know your audience and, and like try to do your best about being responsible with people's time and, and them enjoying what you're making but beyond that dude for sanity's sake when it all gets quiet and it's dark and there's no one around it's just you and the thing that you made 
Do you like it? If you don't like it, then don't do it. Done. That's it. That's it. If you don't like you it, like don't it. do it. If you like it, just do it for you. All right. Yeah. Because no one said you had to film it. Mind blowing. I know. Mind blowing. I know. Fucking yeah. agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. And okay. Uh, two last couple advice. The first advice. What is your advice to do a backflip? I just love that maneuver, but man, how did you do that? A simple backflip, you know? So, if if you don't have anything special, right? Let's say you don't have a trampoline, you don't have a pool, you don't have a gym, right? I have this the grass. This is what I would do. I would go somewhere and I would find an old mattress, right? Okay. Old mattress. I would cover it in plastic just in case, right? You don't know where that thing has been. And then I would start very simply, if you can, I would take that mattress and if you can, I would tie a rope between two trees and I would drape the mattress over it, right? All right. And if it's not, because what you want to be doing is the space between you and the ground. Every backflip is a back handspring, which means when you jump and then you go into a handstand, right? And then your feet hit. Okay. You treat the first experience, like you're protecting yourself. So when you want to go and try a backflip, right, and you're, you just need to take care of that space between your back and the ground. So if you can get an old mattress or you can get something to lay over, just maybe this high, right? But you want to do it where you can jump and barely clear the rope. Because okay. what it'll do is when you start to fall, your hips hit the rope or the mattress and it flips you over, All right? All right. And it gets you unafraid to hit your back or the back of your head on the ground because as soon as you jump into the air and your hips hit it, it will rotate you over. It will teach you a lot. And if you keep trying that and hitting your back on it, if it's soft, and if you throw blankets over a rope, whatever, but you'll learn the height, about hip height, so that when you jump, you keep hitting it, it folds you over, right? And once you learn that, when you get really good, you keep jumping higher and higher and try and keep your head forward, and you start clearing the rope. And when you clear the rope, your hands hit, right? And when yeah. your hands hit, you start to protect yourself. You protect your head. And that's how you really survive it. Now, you can either go to the mattress, put it flat on the ground, and use the tiny bit of bounce to jump and try the flip. But if it was me, I would go somewhere where you have something maybe two feet tall, about this tall, so that you can start your back flip on something. Because the higher okay. you are, the quicker you can, like, you rotate and you don't have to worry about hitting the ground immediately. You have a little bit of time to jump off. Let's say it's this tall per scale where you can jump off and you have more time to see the ground before you hit it and brace yourself. And oh, I would wow. put the mattress, yeah, I would put the mattress right up against that drop and I would go off it onto the mattress, right? And then once you learn that, you can do a big back handspring, go to your hands or go to your stomach on the mattress. It shouldn't hurt. And if it does, just put layers of like a sleeping bag or pillows or whatever to brace yourself up. And once you get that, you can switch just to the mattress on the ground. And now you can use the spring off of the mattress to get just enough jump, throw your hands straight above. Don't throw your hands back or put your head back. Throw your hands straight above your head, stare forward, and then pull your knees up and keep staring forward. And what it'll end up doing is it'll keep you in the air instead of a back handspring where you look for the ground. When you get good, you throw your hands up as high as you can. And when you pull your knees to your chest, it'll flip you around without your head it's much faster and so once you get that on the actual mattress your last step is to start on the ground and go onto the mattress oh, because wow. once you can flip up you're still safe because if you land on the back of your head it's on the mattress but once yeah. you can flip up onto it now you're really getting there now if just jumping off the ground onto the mattress is too much then find a hill and put the mattress against it like this now you start a little bit higher but you're not on a ledge, right? And so you can slowly work the mattress up until the mattress is closer and closer to the level of your feet on the ground. And when you do that, closer and closer and closer, and then soon you're there and you can use it onto the mattress. And then once you do that, you find like a thin maybe uh, pillows or something, then you just put them on the ground by themselves with no mattress, and then you can just do it on the ground, you know? All right. And a pool can help in that sense? A pool can help. But just be sure that the edge of the pool, like get some couch cushions and put them against the edge of the pool in case you flip and don't flip back far enough and hit the edge. All but right. just scoot the, like if here's the edge of the pool, just put the couch cushions where you can jump on the couch cushions and flip and they'll stay right there just in case. Okay. 
Thank you for that explanation and thank you for the effort yeah. that you put to that explanation. Yeah. Yeah. And oh. it's very basic. There's nothing fancy about that either. You know what I mean? Okay. Like you can do that at your house too. So. Okay, that's nice. How, how, how long it took for you to land your first backflip back in the days? Like a month? Oh, a long yeah. time, long time. Long time, the first backflip. Well, so long. And oh. you know what, I could do them Maybe off of like something chest height. I could do it off of something chest height when I was in like seventh or eighth grade, maybe. But when okay. I was younger than that, I was too scared to try. And I couldn't do it on flat ground, like actually do it on flat ground until I was at least in high school. But I was also like, I learned how to do it on a mat or something, you know. So, but, it, but kids now, people now, they're so used to seeing it on the internet that a lot of people can do it pretty quickly. But if you're not one of those people, You also shouldn't get discouraged because that's just the way it goes. Sometimes you're the slow guy, but then sometimes the slow guy also has the best backflip. So, all right, all depends, man. I'm yeah. going for that backflip. Thank you for the advices. Yeah, okay, man. okay, William. Uh, last two questions for this conversation. Um, one to one last advice. How do you deal with the fear? What is your advice to deal with the fear when it comes? I think. I think my advice is this, is that the fear is there for a good reason, right? Because your brain, there's some mechanism just like a, uh, a smoke alarm or just like the, you know, when you keep, leave your car door open and the keys in it, there's that ding, right? They're doing that so that you lock your keys in the car and they're doing that so that you don't die from smoke, right? It's like, it's for a good reason. So your brain has that fear there to tell you like, hey, be careful. What you have to be careful with is the beating the fear is you need to do enough repetitions of whatever you're doing that you're not just getting away with it you own it so yeah. if you feel like if you feel like doing a backflip when you start practicing if you feel like doing it 10 times is good enough for you to get over the fear and then you're not afraid fine but for me i would have to do it a hundred times before i wasn't afraid so to beat the fear a lot of times before i try a trick I'll do it as many times as I possibly can before I ever try it on the obstacle. Because, okay. because that fear is always there when you go to kickflip off the drop, your foot chokes back, your kickflip is yeah. awful, right? Well, what you end up trying to do, this is what you're really doing, is you have your fear thing here, and then you have your actual physical ability of practice, and you try to make this bigger. So that even when you're afraid, you kickflip perfect every try, just every try. You've done it so many times, you can't not do it anymore. And when you do that, your brain will still, it'll still put the alarm off and go, all right, let's be careful here. I'm a little bit timid. Do a couple of practice warm-up tries, whatever. Throw a couple in the grass. But at the end of the day, if you practice enough and you go to the set of stairs and you kickflip, it will just work because your body has built it up. But people don't practice nearly enough. And so when they get there, they're like, oh, this is so hard. I should be able to do this. You shouldn't be able to do it. You haven't even kickflipped that many times. Yeah. You need to use so many kickflips that you're sick of it. That no matter what, in the worst shoes ever, you can kickflip, right? And with that concept, nobody practices as much as they should. If you want to be good, you want to be better than you ever were or good enough to do it on set when they only give you two or three tries, then you do it so many more times than you want to. There's Nice. Do it until you can't not do it, basically. Practice and practice. That always, that always beats the fear. Always. All right. Thank you for that. And one last advice. What is your advice for the person who wants to be the greater in their passion? I would say this. You, yeah, there's different types of people and there's different ambitions and there's different levels whether it's come from your parents or people that you talk to there's certain levels of normal that surround something that you like or are good at there's certain normals of level that of levels that you sort of kind of stick to because you like don't want to seem crazy i would say if you want to be that person that people remember people talk about people use as inspiration i would say you need to be obsessed with what you're doing like to a level that's not unhealthy but definitely close. All right. Because if you want to have everything, you want to be able to like, oh, I want to wake up late and I want to work too hard, but I want to get all this good stuff and I want to make something really cool that no one's ever seen. You're only getting, 
one of those things. You're either waking up, like, like you need to be obsessed at a level that other people don't want to do. For me, like my advice, like that's purely from my own experience that I usually don't get something done that I'm truly proud of unless I've done it more times, like to an embarrassing degree where people are like, how many more times are you gonna come here? Like I've driven to San Diego seven or eight times just to practice a trick and not film it. And it's two hours away each direction, right? Like I don't, without that, if you wanna be, push your passion past whatever, you need to be willing to do something that seems outlandish. But at the same time, for me, the way to justify that is, is I used to spend hours and hours and hours doing bar backing or hauling gravel or doing concrete or doing landscaping. You'd spend eight hours and guess what? No one is filming it. No one is ever going to see or care that you did that. All you have is money, right? So you take that mentality and go, well, if I spent eight hours earning money, I'm going to spend eight hours doing something that other people are going to be like, dude, I usually only skate for three hours at a time or two. <laughs> like, what are we doing? Here? No, you freaking do it like you do a job. Because if you do that, like, I know that advice sounds so obvious, but it's not because everyone normalizes and they go, well, you know, yeah. you can't do it in two hours. You can't do it. No, if you can't do it in two hours, you should stop me. If I don't figure this out, it's going to drive me nuts for forever. So my advice is if you want to like up your passion and what you're doing, do it to a level that you think people will think you're weird for doing. Oh my goodness. Mind blowing. <laughs> Thank That's you. what I would say. I mean, so wise, man. I pretty agree with you. Thank you for that. All right, William. Thank you for the advices. Thank you for the words. Thank you for being part of this, the shit podcast. I really love the vision that you have for skateboarding and for life. And I know that the skate community loves too. So thank you for this. Thank you for thank this you. conversation. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. It was awesome to talk to you. And I really hope that that video part have to be amazing. So let's go for that trick, and and I'm and I'm going to wait until February to watch the insanity in your video. Thanks, thank Mindy. Well, I appreciate the the support, and you let me talk about it. So thank you. Okay. Have a nice day. You too, man. I'll talk to you later. For sure. Thank you. Thank you for the vibes. Goodbye. You're welcome. Man. All right, later. Later.